Hey everybody, welcome to The War Report. I am your host Cyrus, and man, we have a lot of stuff to talk about this week. NXT TakeOver 31, AEW celebrating Chris Jericho's 30 years of wrestling, and just a really good episode of NXT. So, we're going to go into the trenches and talk about all the news that has been happening uh, in the week of wrestling. I'm starting to notice a lot when I'm looking for news or just something to read on that is just not rumors, I guess, like, or, you know, people just reporting speculations and stuff. There's not a lot of AEW stuff. I was on a website. I'm not going to say their name because I don't want to make it seem like, you know, they're not doing a good job reporting, but I went through at least, well, at least till the next following week. So I went through like six pages before it just became last week's news. And all of it is like WWE, NXT, WWE, Impact, some stardoms, uh, G1 stuff. There's a lot of G1 stuff going on right now, but like not a lot of AEW news. So if this in the trenches seems like very NXT centric, it's just because like, Nobody's truly like reporting anything coming out of AEW this past week, which I find is very odd because it's been two weeks now and that's been the case whenever I've been looking for information and trying to read stuff. But we're here in the trenches and NXT acquires a new performance center uh, or not a performance center, sort of their own arena and it's the Capitol Wrestling Center. And I am curious if Raw and SmackDown are going to transition into this building once the M-Way Center, like, rent or lease or, you know, partnership is up. I think the Capitol Wrestling Center looks amazing. I thought NXT 30 looked great. The lighting was great. I like how the... What is it? The Thunderdome? Yeah, the Thunderdome panels are, like far up there and it's not like layers like an onion i like it is on raw and smackdown and it looks like they fit a lot more screens up there so that's cool and they're having a crowd there which is like uh i'm not really uh liking that but it's it's friends and family and they're doing that again last time they had friends and family there was a whole bunch of cases or just like uh So a lot of people tested positive. Yeah, so like a lot of cases. And I'm I'm truly worried for a lot of those wrestlers there, especially with Florida just being Florida, you know? So we'll see how that goes. And kind of a bit of controversial news, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of controversial. Triple H says Velveteen Dream's immaturity in his personal life impacts his professional life. For those who've noticed, I haven't really touched much on the Dream situation since we've talked about it on the episode where we kind of just talked all about the speaking, speaking out stuff. Mainly because I don't know what more I can add to the conversation. Like, I'm kind of on board with everybody else. Like, I would like to see Dream fired or, you know, a true punishment for his actions. And on the TakeOver 31 card, I know people were just like, you know, with the ass whooping that he received, they were just like, oh, man, you know, is this a write-off for him? Or, like, are they just going to put him in the uh, back burner again and have them, like, you know, investigate again or fire the kid and i'm just like after reading this quote i was just like velveteen dream is pretty i i think he's oh like he's a okay but uh it is what it is next we have uh not an official announcement but if you've been you know following Kyrie sane on Instagram or following her on Twitter, she's let people know that she is now an ambassador for WWE. And people think that NXT Japan may be uh, brewing or it's imminent. I, you know, I always thought that was the case. And I'm excited. I can't wait to see which talent they hire and how the shows are going to be presented. Uh, right now, Japan having stardom, uh, 
Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling, DDT Pro. You know, I, I'm wondering how well WWE is going to be re uh, received in Japan. So, I, I think uh, I think we're going to get a lot of good talent. Stardom has recently been getting a lot of criticism in flack for like quote unquote poaching talent, but you know, the game's the game. Damn it, and. I'm excited. I can't wait to see Kyrie Sane possibly be a commentator or, you know, possibly be our William Regal or, you know, our general manager on NXT UK. So, I mean, <laughs> NXT Japan or Tokyo, God knows what it's going to be called, but I'm excited. That should be cool. And big news. I think everybody can agree that they were truly excited when they saw the announcement of NXT Halloween Havoc. A lot of people were just like, why is it this takeover called that? And this is why they just thought it was too early. You know, so they just called it 31 and then the next one is going to be Halloween Havoc. I think it's possibly going to be like, well, dang, I forgot the date. I think it's like the 28th. So I don't want to pull up my calendar because I don't want to like get rid of my notes and hope like mess up the recording. But um. <laughs> I think it's going to be like one of the Great American Bass situations where it's just a big show that's happening on Halloween. Hosted by Shotzi Blackheart. I know she's a big fan of horror films and Halloween in general. So hopefully we get some cool stuff going on the show. In the promotion, they have all the, you know, they have all the champions and the creepy characters. Like uh, Dexter Loomis is in it. Shotzi Blackheart is in it. I'm, I'm hoping they have like some special matches that are Halloween themed mixed in with, you know, really important title stuff. So it's not just like a show you can miss, like have must watch stuff on it and, you know, fun Halloween things. I think that would really be the cherry on top of the whole thing. And before we get into the shows, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the draft. So NXT has it officially been a part of the draft or anything like that? Uh, Ryan Satin posted the news earlier today of what the draft rules are. Like, it's, I think it's it's the same rules as it's always been. But, you know, it's back and a lot of people have been doing, like, mock drafts or, you know, predictions and stuff like that. But I'm going to do the opposite. I would like to see who would come down from the uh from the main roster and first things first i would love to see randy orton come down after he's done with his whole drew mcintyre thing everybody is kind of wanted to see the match between him and Ciampa or whatever feud that could come from that i think that would be fantastic that would be great i would like to see kevin owens come down i think kevin owens coming down would be really cool especially if undisputed era is still on NXT when the draft finishes, I would love to see Kevin Owens just come down. And when I mean come down, I don't mean like stay for a long period of time like uh, Tyler Breeze has or um, who else? Can't think of anybody right now. But just a couple months like a program similar to what Charlotte did uh, earlier this year. So I would love to see Kevin Owens, Randy Orton. And if I had to pick a woman to come down... Oh, man. Well, we already have a special surprise that we'll talk about later on on the show. Uh, let me pause the recording so I can truly think about who I want. Okay, we're back. After long evaluation, I would have to say, I know this is probably going to be a weird pick. Don't groan when you hear this, but let Billy Kay come down. And not as a one-off. I would like to see her stay in NXT. I know a lot of people read the reports where People were just like, you know, Vince sees more than in Peyton Royce than, you know, than he sees in Billy. So just let Billy Kay come down rather than have her, you know, just do nothing or flounder on the, uh, on the SmackDown or Raw roster. Why not just have her come around on NXT? I think the NXT women division is definitely good, but I don't think it would hurt to have her involved in some shape or form. So I think that would be really nice. Now we're going to get into the meat of the show, TakeOver 31. From top to bottom, this show is absolutely amazing. I know everybody 
Everybody's favorite match of the night is Kyle O'Reilly versus Finn Balor. One of the greatest NXT matches I've seen in a really long time. Possibly Finn Balor's best match in a really long time. Kyle O'Reilly. Just an amazing talent. Like I'm I'm sure we all know how great he is. So a match anything less than five stars, like <laughs> probably would have been like wow, like for real. But this this was really great. This match had everything I wanted in it. You know, great tent great technique, you know, technical stuff in the ring. Kyle O'Reilly is amazing with that. And violence. And we'll talk about the violence right now, where Finn Balor suffers a broken jaw in two places. And that's kind of like crazy. So Finn Balor is like, he's not medically cleared, but I think he'll come back fairly soon. I don't know how jaw injuries work, but I, I think he wouldn't have to relinquish the title. I think he'll be out for less time than carrying crosses. So I don't see NXT possibly doing a number one contendership or you know, another tournament or vacating the title again. And Kyle O'Reilly suffers an injury that I didn't really know about until I watched the injury report earlier today, a swollen liver. That's insane. And when they played the footage back of where the injury sort of happened, it's kind of crazy. Like Kyle O'Reilly getting like that step up knee where his, uh, his knee pad is like sorted down so yeah Balor kind of just like ate full knee right there and it shows and Kyle O'Reilly getting the kick like it's, it's just like a like a thrust kick uh to like the midsection and it got him really bad I hope Kyle O'Reilly is okay I know he has diabetes so he's sort of uh immunocompromised so I hope he's okay because when he was on NXT, he didn't have any visible injuries, and he was talking, so I was just like, the missing, or like the broken teeth stuff is probably like Cap, because I remember when Cesaro broke his teeth, and then, you know, man, he, he, he was not talking, or when he would talk, it would just be like all muffled, but if that's truly the case, that he lost some teeth or whatever, you know, just near up, just near up. Interesting angle at the end of the match, though, where Ridge Holland uh, just has a beating of Adam Cole over his shoulder, and he just presents it to Kyle O'Reilly and Finn Balor, make you know staking his claim, or just it looks like they were sort of leading up to a who done it kind of story because he shows up on Wednesday with a Benz, and he was just like, you know, I bodied Adam Cole, so you know. I'm whipped up now. Now that is most likely scrapped because, man, he got injured pretty bad on Wednesday. I have a screenshot of the report here. It says ankle dislocation and a fracture and a dislocation and ruptured tendon. He's going to be out for quite some time. Those are injuries you don't play with. So... That's truly unfortunate. I felt like they were going to do truly big things here. And NXT just has some injury bug truly lingering around. But hopefully, Rich Holland makes a speedy recovery. But now, we're going to get to the top of the card. Where the show starts with Priest and Gorgano. Which I thought was also great. People were saying that there were botches, but had no proof of it. Like, there's no gifts going around proving where, you know, they were sloppy in any, you know, shape or form. So, the match is really good, despite all the cap. And Damian Priest wins, and I'm truly curious where they go with the North American title. We haven't seen Bronson Reed for quite some time. Tim Thatcher uh, shows up on Wednesday in a video package. Cameron Grimes seems like he's going to be busy. So I'm I'm truly curious what, uh, where Damian Priest goes next. But stellar match. And, you know, we already see where Johnny goes after this. Uh, so there is a vacant spot for challenging in the North American title. But it was really good stuff. And now we go into the singles match with uh, Kushida versus Velveteen Dream. And Kushida beat the living hell out this kid. 
I love the finish to the match. I love Kushida's intensity. Having the hoverboard lock, Dream doing the Dream Valley driver and not letting go is heat. That is that's some that's some shit right there. <laughs> like that, that was really great. I love that finish a lot. And people thought that Dream was basically done here. Like this was gonna be the beginning of the write-off, but as I said earlier, I don't think that's gonna happen. But all good stuff. Sorry if it offends, but it was really good. Now we're going to get into Santos Escobar versus Isaiah Swerve Scott. This is probably their best match yet. Very uh, minimal shenanigans here. And I'm not sure if Scott is going to get the call up or not because he does lose this match. And I don't see him truly going anywhere after this. Like, I'm... I'm truly confused where he goes. Unless he moves up into the North American title scene, I don't know what he's going to be doing in the Cruiserweight division. But, uh, dang, I forgot his new new name. Uh, Tuhuti Miles came up and assisted, but I forgot his new name. Is like something Adonis? I'm not sure. Sorry, and I don't want to pause the recording again to look it up. But I think he may be slotted in next to challenge Santos Escobar or just be an ally for Santos Escobar. I mean, be an ally for Swerve Scott, and hopefully he doesn't have to rely on uh, Brizongo to help him again for another possible six-man tag. But that's, that's where they are with that. Santos Escobar is really great. I hope they have another challenger lined up for him fairly soon because I don't want to I don't want to see him just like stagnant and not doing anything. I think he's a great addition to the NXT show and once they get that cruiserweight title off him, I definitely see like the North American Championship in his like future. Like that's definitely where I would slot him at least. Io Shirai and Candice LeRae was a phenomenal match. I thought the finish was a little weird. Like I'm, I've never been the huge fan of interferences and cheating, but I did think Johnny Gargano kind of played it slick, where he had the title and then he just like slipped it across his back, sliding the title to Candice. I thought that was cool. Not a fan of the you know I'm gonna put on the shirt or whatever thing because Bailey and Sasha already did it and it didn't do nothing for me there, so I'm not a hypocrite. <laughs> and. I'm not sure if I'm sold 100% yet on heel Candice LeRae, but she definitely put on a stellar match here. I don't know if I can say it's better than their last match, but I thought this match was uh, really good. I don't know where Io Shirai goes after this. It seems like there's a lot of challengers kind of set up for her. Um, Tony Storm made her presence known. That she will be coming to NXT date pending. Uh, Rhea Ripley seems to still be busy with uh, Raquel Gonzalez and Dakota Kai. And there's a new person that appears on the show as well. A returning NXT champion. Thank God it isn't the ones that everybody predicted. <laughs> Ember Moon's back. And she made her... You know, championship aspirations known. So, Io Shirai does have a lot of challengers lined up, but we'll see how they do the number one contenders thing. People are saying triple threat, triple who, and not triple threat, um, fatal four way. With whom? I don't know because I don't see um, Dakota Kai and Raquel being on opposing sides. I I think that would be cool, but right now I don't see them facing each other and Tony Storm hasn't made her presence known yet so I think they're gonna just give her a title shot up front instead of you know going through hoops and jumps and stuff like that but I still think that Rhea Ripley may be like the feud that they're gonna have and huh now that I'm thinking about it Tony Storm might be the backup in case like Rhea Ripley gets called up or something but it is what it is and Oh, that's it. That's TakeOver 30. Uh, I thought it was a stellar show. I think this is definitely up there with In Your House. Uh, 
Mania. Shit. I, I thought this was a really stellar show top to bottom. And WWE has been doing stellar stuff with the pay-per-views. This is like their... They're on a good streak of pay-per-views right now. I think it's four so far. And I think Halloween Havoc is going to be great. Uh, Hell in a Cell. Uh, you know, Hell in a Cell might break the streak because, you know, there's draft shenanigans and stuff like that. So God knows what happens there. But for NXT, at least, it's been really great shows back to back to back. And now we go into NXT. I have no idea why you did what you did. Truth be told, I don't care. Because, Ridge, you broke my ribs, and now you are a dead man. And that is undisputed. This is a really good show as well. Uh, I definitely think, like, the Capitol Wrestling Center definitely makes it pop. Like, it, it, it breathes, you know, fresh air into NXT that is more than just opening up the entrance ramp you know just uh putting up more barricades the capitol wrestling center makes this show feel a lot more special you know but the show starts with kushida and tomaso champa and i thought this if this match was on the takeover card like this would probably be like the second best match there. I don't know if that's being disrespectful or not, or like a backhand compliment, but this this uh, match was really good. Not a fan of the finish here with uh, Velveteen Dream interfering, but it is what it is. I think they're just trying to postpone some things while they figure out if Balor's okay, and then they could put uh, Kushida in that spot. But it is what it is. Ember Moon cuts a promo, and people are, it's, people are really being mean about it. I don't think this is, like, the worst promo that I've heard from her. You know, she doesn't get the mic often, and she even said, like, she was surprised that she even got mic time. I don't think that she's, like, insanely awful, but she just seems uncomfortable on the mic to me. And that's okay. Shit, we're all uh, mic shy, I guess. But... People are ragging on her promo skills and her appearance, and she has what counts. She can wrestle. <laughs> and that's truly all I can ask for. She's uh, She comes back from a career-threatening injury in the main event, having a stellar showing. Like, I don't care if she has an appearance that you don't personally agree with, or, you know, she looks like she rated... Uh, Rhea Ripley's closet like I think her new look is cool people are still trying to find out like oh man what's her character is I'm not gonna try to like you know dive that deep and try to like figure it out but she has what counts to me right now that she is an amazing wrestler and that's fantastic that is all I can ask for and with her promo sets up the main event the girls are fighting Rhea Ripley wanted to say some things, and then Raquel and Dakota Kai beat her up again, and then we get Dakota Kai, Raquel versus Rhea Ripley, insert face here. Like, I think we've seen this match many a times already in the past couple of months, but it is what it is because the match was fantastic. EO doesn't seem to care at all, and that's why I think that EO is going to get you know sort of put into the background a little bit while they try to figure out who's the number one contender stuff uh who's the number one contender and you know try to figure things out when the draft happens like i think they're just preparing for people to just get randomly called up so i understand and that's fine with me now something really important that i wanted to talk about is the indy hartwell and the Gargano family things. Andy Hartwell surprises the Gargano family with a very impressive new TV. And inside of the TV, there is a USB showing Andy Hartwell sort of being Candace's guardian angel in the battle royale that she's won to get her number one contendership uh, match with Io Shirai that happened at TakeOver 31. I like that Candice LeRae is being very hesitant to 
embrace Indy Hartwell in because she's let in many people before and they all have betrayed her. So in the video package, you see Gargano being like, oh man, you know, I always liked that girl. Or, you know, he's he continues to express her approval of Indy Hartwell. And then you just see Candace just being like, you know, like shooken up or just like being worried about it. And I like that a lot. And I hope when this whole thing comes together, Indy Hartwell comes out looking great. And Candace isn't like being portrayed again because she's been playing this big sister, little sister role for a really long time. And to do it again as a heel in her new character, quote unquote, that doesn't, that's kind of a problem for me. But if this means that Indy Hartwell gets to improve and get more TV time, be featured more, you know, possibly taking one of the spots of the women that possibly is going to get called up in the draft. I'm all for it, but I would like Candice LeRae to be, I want to see them kind of like sort of like drag it out where she slowly starts to embrace her. And hopefully there isn't a betrayal in the end. Now we're going to get into the in-ring return of my favorite NXT superstar, Dexter Loomis. Austin Theory beats up Leon Ruff, who uh, officially signed with NXT, along with some other Evolve wrestlers this week. Beats the hell out of him, but I think that that's going to be the thing where, you know, get beat up, get put in the back, get your name changed, come back. But um, Austin Theory talks that talk, uh, and then... Dexter Loomis is just like, you know, I'll, I'll kick your ass right now. And Loomis looks great. He looks rejuvenated. I'm glad he came back healthy and the same. He did, he hasn't regressed at all. He beats the hell out of Theory, just like Adam Cole did. And then gets hit with one of the sne- sneaky cave-ins by uh, Cameron Grimes when the bell rings. And that seems to be one of the matches that we're possibly going to have at Halloween Havoc. And that spell, I think that spells doom for <laughs> Cameron Grimes there. You don't want to f- mess with the spooky man on the spooky theme show. <laughs> Looking at my notes here and... Yeah, that's more or less the show. That is NXT. I read it out of order, so got back to the main event that I already spoke about. But uh, we're going to transition into AEW celebrating Jericho's 30th year in wrestling. We're going to start out with an announcement for the AEW 8-man tournament. Three more contenders have been announced. We have Hangman Page, maybe in the same bracket as Kenny. God knows. I hope they don't. Wardlow and Cabana. I'm obviously not too excited about the Cabana pick. I'm very vocal about my thoughts on him. But the field right now is... Kenny Omega, Jungle Boy, Phoenix, Hangman Page, Warlow, and Coca Bana. There is two more contenders to be added. I am praying to God that Miro is in it. And for the second pick, I think it might be Sammy Guevara. There's no inner circle representation in the match. So, I mean, in the tournament. So, I think he's sort of a shoe in for the match. Now we get into the very brutal, very violent TNT Championship match with a result that I'm not too happy with, but I sort of understand, I guess. Brody Lee and Cody were beating the hell out of each other. You know, I like violence. I like the use of the dog chain for a lot of the match. For the result, I understand you know, Brody Lee was just keeping the title warm for Cody, I guess. I'm I'm not too upset about it. I definitely thought that the TNT title made Brody Lee feel more of a threat alongside Dark Order. Because, you know, having gold proving that you're a champion is good leadership. You know, I, I've said it before on other episodes. Cody having it and then having a title match with Orange Cassidy 
who already lost a and championship match two weeks ago, is a choice. But I think it will be an okay match. I think it will be fine. Cody gets to sort of have a good time now that he's back in AEW. We have another match on the show for the FCW title. Don't know why we're truly fighting for this, but it is what it is. Will Hobbs and Brian Cage. I thought this was a really good match. I thought they had okay chemistry, like just two big dudes truly slugging it out. Power slam each other, doing all that. Unfortunately, Will Hobb loses, and he's offered to join Team Taz. Now, I think he would be a really good fit for the group. He is a big powerhouse wrestler. I think him and Brian Cage could possibly be like a really good tag team in the future. You know, AEW loves tag teams, so why not pull the trigger on that at some point in time? Now, what I'm not particularly too big of a fan of is Darby Allen's kind of a run-in on the, in the segment. I I don't get it. Like, can we do something else with Darby Allen rather than walk around with the skateboard whenever the FTW crew does anything menacing? And like, Darby Allen is a pretty small dude and the ft do uh the ftw guys already bodied him before so i don't know why they see him with a skateboard and there's already like a beaten up man in the ring and they're scared to just like go in there and beat the hell out of him you know but hopefully there is a blow off with them soon like moxley's already finished with them now it's will hobbs and still darby allen like i just think that they could move on to bigger and better things at this point there is a a lot more people on the show that could possibly benefit from a feud with Taz. So I think they should possibly wrap that up soon. Tag team action. I'm glad to see the hybrid two back. I like Jack Evans and Hank uh, and Helico a lot. They've been out for quite some time. I can't remember the last time they had a match on Dynamite. I'm sure they're on AEW Dark, but we don't watch that here. I don't have enough time. I don't even watch NXT UK. So, oh man, especially with like the G1 and doing the stardom stuff. But (laughs) nonetheless, I thought they had a stellar match with the Revival. I thought it was really good. And after the match, we get a weird kind of... I don't, it's, it's not even, I don't even think it was like a segment or anything, but it was just like a video of the Young Bucks. Super King Kick a cameraman like they used to do in ROH, but they actually kicked a dude this time. And then they were just like, oh, you're going to pay the fine? Nah. Nah. So I'm curious whatever they're going to do there with the Young Bucks. Hopefully after the revival, have the match with the best friends who came to announced that they will have a title match in next week against FTR. Get their match. Like, I would love to get the Young Bucks and FTR thing kind of out of the way so we can actually see other tag team prospects possibly take the title from them. But AEW also likes their really long title reigns, so God knows. (laughs) They might beat the Young Bucks and just hold it forever like Jon Moxley is right now. And speaking of John Moxley, he has a video package next week on AEW's year anniversary. We'll be getting John Moxley versus Lance Archer. Uh, Archer is back from COVID vacation. And I like the promo from Moxley here. I know that's kind of rare for me, at least. But Moxley just kind of just being like, you know, My time will possibly come where I'm no longer champion. Uh, What he said in his own promo where he was just like, you know, a samurai plotting his or plotting or visioning his own demise. Something like that. But I really like that because that's the vibe that I got from the promo. Lance Lance Archer is a really, like, really good wrestler and he is a killer and we've seen all that. And Moxley knows that from their uh, match in New Japan, I think earlier this year i'm not too sure about that it may have been earlier this year but he's just like you know lance archer is a really like strong dude so shit god knows what might happen here i thought that put over lance archer 
fairly well because he's been absent for these shows, so they didn't get to do the six man with the FTW crew, and it, it's just a shame that it took this long. But I think it taking place at the one year anniversary of AEW is sort of poetic in itself. And now we get to the sort of main event or the you know the grand finale of this show Jericho and Hager versus Luther and Sir Pentico. I'm gonna keep it really real with y'all. I'm gonna keep it really 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 real with y'all. I couldn't watch this full match. I couldn't do it. I just can't. I can't do it, bro. I I I tried and I just said I fast forward uh, and then watch the promo that was happening uh, at the end of the match. I think it's really nice for Chris Jericho to give Luther that look. Let him main event Dynamite. That's his boy. That's cool. I can't do it, son. I already watched a whole bunch of G1 matches today. There's a lot of other stuff I would like to do with my time. <laughs> but I thought the MJF promo that happened at the end with Jericho celebrating, I thought that was really cool. They te- they teased a little uh like a face off thing, which they gave us a swerve, but I think that might actually be something later on. Like I don't think they should truly drop the ball on that face off. MJF is a uh egotistic maniac and Jericho sort of big dogging him at that moment had to be eating him inside. So I would like for him to at least exp- express some sort of like anger about that you know like I I think that would be really cool but a clown comes out he's holding a portrait of MJF Jericho breaks it over his head they do the face off and then uh, it's all jokes it's all fun and time and then everybody out in the AEW roster screw COVID comes out with uh, a little bit of the bubbly and they're all just popping champagne with Chris Jericho I I liked Chris Jericho a lot. He was one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. Uh, when I started becoming a huge wrestling head or, you know, like a, a mark, I was watching a lot of his matches in uh, WCW. I think I, at the time I was on Tumblr and I saw a picture against him and Ultimo Dragon and I was just like, oh, that shit look cool. I had the WWE Network and I was just like, fuck it, I guess I'll watch. So Jericho being that sort of uh you know entry point of wrestling at that point in time greatly appreciated i know everybody feels a certain ways about jericho right now including myself but i can look back in the past and acknowledge the great stuff that he has put together in the wrestling ring god knows you know what he does outside the ring hey man i don't want to talk about it but what he does in there is really good stuff and shit hope to another 30 as they say for people's birthdays and stuff like that (laughs) but that is our show aw nxt and takeover 30 are in the books we have big shows ahead of us so stay tuned to the a show network we have a lot of good stuff coming very soon g show me and justin talking about a lot of the g1 stuff the a show The A Show. Do I need to say more? The Rewriters Room with Armand and Gang talking about all sorts of what ifs and fantasy booking sort of things in wrestling. And there's going to be another spot callers that come up. Earlier this week, a live watch was uploaded from me and my friend Alora for the Stardom 5 Star Grand Prix. Definitely check that out and check out any matches from that tournament i definitely think stardom has a really good roster going on and hopefully when you see that you can just go into a deep dive of other joshi wrestling that's happening in uh in japan but really good stuff and we're gonna we're gonna do it we're gonna do the tna victory road 2011 i've been calling it 2001 but it's 2011 we're gonna do it it's coming i don't want it to come but it's coming so be on the lookout for that and that's our show see you guys next next (laughs) video i'm not cutting that out you know what i'm not cutting that out 
I'll see you guys next week. And hopefully I'll have a guest. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, bringing back a lot of guests coming on. I just wanted to experiment with some things on the show and then see how it goes. But see you guys. Cody Lee and <laughs> Cody Lee. <laughs> you know what? I might keep that in. Oh, my Lord.